Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to Old Hillbilly Horror Podcast. I had always been drawn to the quiet beauty of the hills near Silverton. As a park ranger, I was fortunate to spend my days surrounded by nature's splendor. I thought I knew the landscape like the back of my hand, but one incident would change my perspective forever. It started with a phone call from a distressed woman named Linda. She told me that her mother and sister had encountered something strange and terrifying near their home in the hills. She described it as a troll, a short, hairy creature that marched back and forth in front of their house. Her family was so frightened that they had fled to a motel for the night. Intrigued and concerned, I decided to investigate. I drove out to their house, nestled in the heart of the hills, and began my search. As I approached the property, a sense of unease washed over me. The air seemed heavy, as if the very atmosphere was warning me to turn back. I pressed on, stepping out of my vehicle and scanning the area for any signs of the mysterious creature. The ground was covered in a thick layer of leaves, which made it difficult to discern any tracks or traces. As I walked around the house, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Suddenly, I heard a rustling sound coming from a nearby thicket. Heart pounding, I approached cautiously, my hand resting on the pepper spray attached to my belt. As I pulled back the branches, I was met with the sight of the creature Linda's family had described. It was short, no more than four feet tall and covered in coarse matted hair. It stared at me with beady eyes that seemed to pierce my very soul. Then, without warning, it began to march back and forth, just as Linda's mother and sister had recounted. I stood there, frozen in shock and disbelief, as the creature continued its bizarre display. It seemed uninterested in me, focused solely on its repetitive pacing. I knew I had to do something, but what could a park ranger like me do against such an unknown being? Gathering my courage, I shouted at the creature, hoping to scare it away. To my surprise, it stopped and looked at me, its eyes narrowing with curiosity. I took a step forward, my voice firm but shaky. You need to leave this place. You're scaring the people who lie here. The creature tilted its head, as if considering my words, and then, without a sound, it turned and disappeared into the forest. I stood there for a moment, processing what had just happened, before hurrying back to my vehicle. I'm 38 and an army veteran trying to work as a local carpenter in Maine, the state where I have almost always lived. I've had two encounters with the creature I will soon tell you about, one that occurred when I was a teenager and actually one a couple years ago. The house I am currently living in is my father's since he now has multiple heart conditions and would have to live alone. I and my sister grew up in this house which is in eastern Maine. Living here as a child always felt a little off as if something was not right in a way it's hard to describe. The house is surrounded by woods on almost all sides and sits on a dead-end road with six or seven houses down the way. We own 70 acres of dense forest that are littered with the TV trails and walking trails. I've been out on these trails over a hundred times, probably just clearing them for neighbors who we let use them and just trying to maintain them but every time I'm out there, I feel like I'm being stalked. In this area, I nor my father have ever seen a bear, wolf, or mountain lion, nothing really above the size of a bobcat. As a teen, I liked dressing up in military gear and going out to play war and games similar. Normally go out with my friends Sid and Marvin, two guys who lived down the road. Sid was an older dude around 18 who smoked and did average, tough guy stuff. Marv, who I still am friends with today, we even served together until he was discharged, was more on my level. We were both pretty timid young guys who didn't really associate with most people and just enjoyed being out in the woods and chilling. Anyway, one day we had gone out around 3 p.m. on a chilly winter evening to go play as we did most days. We all grabbed our gear, which was stuff that Sid's dad, who was a Vietnam vet, had given him, and then Sid had shared with us. This included medical kits, an ammo box, grenade pouches, etc. 
He even gave Sid an old handgun without the magazine or ammunition, but Sid's dad still didn't allow him to take it out of the house. So after a while of walking down one of the paths, we come to one of our favorite spots, which is sort of like a clearing full of boulders and moss. At the time, it was covered in knee-deep snow. Normally, my mother would not have let us go out this far, but she wasn't there to say no since she was in New Hampshire for the holidays. We had been out there for quite a while throwing snowballs and pretending they were grenades and blasting at each other with our sticks. It was about 5 p.m. when we were starting to gather our stuff because it was beginning to get dark. As I'm scooping up my stuff, Marv talks in a confused and worrisome tone. Hey guys, what the hell is that thing? He draws our attention to a tall, completely black creature standing on two legs, its arms dangling by its sides and dragging through the snow. From our angle at 50 or 60 meters away, we couldn't see its face, but it was walking away from us. I remember a weird tightness in my chest after realizing that I had no idea what we were looking at. Then Sid yelled out, hey hairball, then the creature stopped. My chest grew even tighter, and it felt like my body was frozen after I saw its abrupt stop. It slowly turned towards us. Its face had no facial features, but it looked to be plain flesh. No nose, eyes, or mouth. We were so frightened that none of us could talk. It stared at us for a couple minutes before one of us suggested the bright idea of leaving. We crept away as the sun was now really low, while one of us constantly looked back until we got out of sight. Then we bolted back to my house where we hid inside, collapsing onto the living room floor. We were silent for a moment before I broke out laughing. The others joined in. After a few seconds, Sid said, Okay, guys, but WTF did we just see? We tried rationalizing, but I think we all knew that we had seen something that didn't belong. The guys ended up staying the night at my place that night. We stayed up late drinking hot chocolate and every now and then stepping onto the front porch to see if it may have followed us. After a couple days, the creature mostly disappeared from our minds. We still got together and hung out having adventures in the woods. I never told my parents about this thing that we saw because they probably would have believed me, and I didn't want to go through all the trouble of explaining it to them over and over. Neither did I tell my sister because she wouldn't care and I wouldn't receive any feedback, so it was pointless. We three also never really brought the creature up again. It was like an unspoken agreement. My second encounter transpired in roughly the same area about a mile or two from there three years ago. I had just been honorably discharged and been home with my father for no more than a month picking up odd jobs, mostly in auto and house repairs, both being skills I learned from my time overseas. It was a summer evening when I decided to head out on the trails and take a look around after all. I haven't been out there for ages and expected the trails to be overgrown. So I took with me some basic brush clearings equipment such as a hatchet, an old machete, and some other stuff and then set out. Sid had recently moved to Vermont and Marv had been medically discharged a while ago and left with a leg disability making it hard to walk. I would have asked him to join me if not for his disability. I had made it half a mile into the main path moving and cutting up the suspected limbs, branches, and overgrown grass as best as possible hoping to come back tomorrow with a weed whacker to do some more work. As I got deeper the feeling of being watched returned, the same feeling I got as a teenager when I was out there, and I began noticing that the dense growth was getting thinner and more and more limbs were smashed or pushed out of the way. As well, the tall grass and overgrowth were no longer in the way. In fact, the trail became almost cleared and looked like it used to. I was shocked that somebody cared enough to come out here and clear all this. But as I thought on it more, I remembered that the entrance hadn't been groomed. So how did they get in? I began looking closely at the ground, noticing feet or paw prints I had never seen before. I crouched down to gain a better look. The print had three pointy toes each about six inches long and were spaced about three feet apart in sets of two. I didn't recognize these and decided to just follow them a little further to check it out. About a quarter of a mile later, I see this creature. My second encounter, and so far my last time. 
It was walking from the side of the path at a slow pace, not acknowledging my presence. Not yet, at least. It slowly crossed the path and continued into the woods, and after a minute I walked up to the area where he had entered, and there it was strolling or creeping into the woods, still not noticing me. I could hear his arms dragging across the forest floor and his fur coat still looked silky black, yet I wanted to see its face again, but not to the point where I would risk being spotted. So I slowly reached for my phone only to realize that it was in the front pocket of my backpack as I didn't want to lose it while working. I pulled the bag from my shoulders and placed it in front of me and began unzipping the pocket. But as I did the creature stopped as he had done the last time. Oh Lord Jesus, I thought as I froze and my chest tightened. It began to turn. Its fleshy face began staring back at me. I tightened the grip on the hatchet I had in hand. And now that I think about it, that probably wouldn't have done much to the eight-foot behemoth, now that I think about it. We both stared motionless for what felt like hours. In reality, I had no idea how long we had been there. I eventually stood up with my legs feeling numb. I backed away until it was out of sight, and then took off as fast as I could go. As I was running, I was sure I heard a violent scream from behind me, but I wasn't going to turn to look. Long story short, I haven't been back in those woods for three years and don't plan on it either. I know this may sound over-exaggerated or fake like something from a children's book, but I know what I saw and Marvin knows what he saw. I will never forget this. I was living in a travel trailer for a time on my sister's property, about three acres or so, circa the summer of 2019. The house was in the front, on half the property, and I was in the wild lands back field behind the backyard. This was near Redding, California, and the Sacramento River, only several blocks away, basically in the country and county outside of town, but quite a few residences up and down the streets around the area on big lots. I don't remember what made me open the door and stick my head out to look around one late evening, but something caused me to do it. Maybe some noise. As I was looking around, I heard what sounded like several very slow footsteps in dry brush going crack. Snap. Crack. Like someone was walking away slowly, kind of being stealthy. I then realized it was right there, about 15 feet away, maybe on this side of the sea through wire fence, but it could have been right on the other side of the neighbor's property back section. So I was looking, waiting to see some animal wildlife or something, but there was nothing. It was dark, but I had my outside trailer light on and there was some good moonlight. If there was something there, I should have been able to see it. Then I heard someone run off into the backfield. It had to be a very large, if not huge, heavy animal like a horse. It was bump, 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 bump. I was surprised it didn't shake the ground or trailer but not a four-legged horse like Clippity-Clop. It was an obvious two-legged run, probably with a very long stride. And then it was gone. But I saw nothing like it was invisible. I went back in and locked my door and nothing else happened. I looked around the next day for some footprints, but didn't find any. I can only think that it must have been a Bigfoot. Is it possible that it was cloaked or invisible? Okay, so a few years ago, maybe like two or three, I was out walking out in the woods behind my grandmother's house, and I had a really bad feeling like I was being watched and heard something following behind me. Deer season was just about to start, so I thought nothing about it because I thought it might be a deer. Deer tend to hang out in the woods, so it wasn't much of a worry. I was about to head back through the trees and found a tree that I didn't feel particularly comfortable being near as I had picked up bad vibes, but I was being stupid and I looked around the tree, and it had like really big and strange claw marks in and on the bark of it. There was also some bones from what I'm guessing was a canine. When I had made it out of the woods, I had went inside the house. I don't really remember how I got there and my grandmother and why I had been bleeding. Note that I always carry a knife on me, so I went into the bathroom to patch it up. That was the end of that interaction. Something of the same sort had happened a few months later when I was visiting my aunt. 
I had also decided to explore the woods near her place, and I had caught a glimpse of a really tall figure covered in fur. I had taken out my photo to take a picture of it and zoomed in to get a better look at it, and noticed it was covered in leaves and a little bit of blood. It had very large antlers, so I went back to her house and researched about it. Both settings of the woods were both more so marshy, so I decided to just call the Wendigo Marsh. So now I have a Wendigo that lives out behind my grandparents' house. I had also wound up hearing a call and screaming when I was walking. My significant other and I used to manage a fly and fishing resort outpost in very far northwestern Ontario. We did this for a few years in the summers. We would live on an island from late April, early May until mid-October on a lake that had no road, rail access at all. There was also no phone service, no internet, no TV, no electric grid, no indoor plumbing, etc. This shit was as remote as it gets, and we'd live it for seven months out of our year. Now, typically, the planes that get people in and out of there are little Cessnas and 50-year-old de Havilland beavers and otters, cubs slash super cubs and the like. Very old, loud planes that you can hear coming miles away, fly low 5,000 feet typically, and don't fly past sundown. So this one night, me and significant other are outside having before bed smoke and dog is out with us. We're alone this week on the lake as there's no guests on the lake at all meaning there's no other humans for about 500 kilometers in any direction from us. It's about 12 a.m., pitch black, and suddenly we see this light come over the trees of our island. But something's off about it. It's not a shooting star or an airplane that's apparent. It moves weirdly, changes direction suddenly, changes altitude. It's almost scanning for something. It's also completely silent. As we watch it, we both have this feeling of dread and fear. The dog also begins to freak out, barking and hair standing up on end. At this point, we run inside and turn every light in our cabin off. We then watch as it continues onward over the lake. As it goes, it stops in intervals and adjusts its altitude. Up scans forward a few hundred feet. Down scans forward, up scans forward. Down scans forward. It does this until it's over the next tree line and out of sight. It took us another hour to fall asleep. We've never been believers, so to speak, in extraterrestrial life or unearthly UFOs, but that pretty much converted us on the spot because it was so scary we were shaking afterward. I'm just glad someone was with me because every time I write this it sounds crazy, but it happened. I was going to drive from D.C. to Charlotte, North Carolina alone. I figured, why not post in the rideshare section to get some company and gas money? A guy messages me saying that he's interested in joining me for the ride, but he lives in Richmond, Virginia. No problem. Richmond is on the way. I respond with some information about myself and my interests, seeing as though I'm planning to spend several hours with this guy. He replies asking if we can drop off a duffel bag in Petersburg, Virginia. It sounds a bit suspicious, but sure, I tell him, no problem. We're three days away from the day we're supposed to leave. He messages me saying that he's not sure if he can go anymore because he's still waiting to hear back from his probation officer. He then goes on telling me how much of a bitch she is for making him check in and that he shouldn't even be required to notify her before he leaves the state of Virginia. I didn't reply. I was on a flight back from Thailand. We were flying to Detroit via Toronto. Well, a major storm had us stuck in Toronto for a day and a half. Every flight it seemed like we might leave then at the last second we wouldn't. I got to talking to a few people because we kept seeing each other for every possible flight out. Finally, I tell this guy I've been chatting with, man, F this, we're only a few hours from Detroit. I'm renting a car. He said, yeah, me too. I said, well, if you want to save money, we can just share a car. I could see from the look on his face that his butthole puckered hard enough to make diamonds. He no doubt thought I was bringing in drugs and would land him in prison for life. 
Obviously, we drove separately. He was sort of vindicated. For each possible flight, we had to go through customs each time, which meant I had what looked like about six trips from us to Canada in two days with Thailand thrown in as well. You better believe they searched the living shit out of my car at the border like four hours of searching. When I female was 19, I was looking for a room to rent in the city I was moving to for college. It was about an hour away from my family. I wasn't having much luck and my mom started helping me look for a place. She found an ad on Craigslist for a room for $300 in a house, everything included. The homeowner was a man and he rented the additional rooms upstairs to other women while he lived in the finished basement. The ad stated he rarely ever saw the other roommates because he had a kitchen and his own entrance downstairs, and that he preferred women because he had issues with male roommates in the past partying and causing damage. We decided to take a look since it was the cheapest that we could find in the area. My mom and I went to the house to view it. Decent house, decent neighborhood. He opened the door and was very welcoming. He was middle-aged and the kitchen and living room were furnished nicely and clean. My mom loves to talk and get to know people so they were engaged in conversation while I stood there quietly and observed the place. He then said he would show me my room. We head towards the staircase to go up as I thought, since he said on the phone my room was upstairs with the other roommates, but he opens another door and we follow. He takes us down to the basement and opens a door to a very small room no closet and no windows. He proceeds to say this is my room and I will be sharing the bathroom and the hallway with him. And his bedroom did not have a door on it. I was definitely thinking absolutely not this is weird, but they were so deep in conversation that I couldn't interject. He then leads us to the upstairs and shows us the other rooms which the doors were open and says they are currently rented. He then starts telling us elaborate stories about the other women not very nice stories describing drinking problems. My mom was listening intently, but I took the time to investigate further. I looked in all three rooms in the bathrooms. There was furniture, but not a single item in there that looked like it belonged to a woman, no clothes or anything, only men's clothes in one of the closets. He had no problem with me creeping around his tenants' rooms without their permission. I then heard him tell my mom that he has some of his stuff in their closets, but they don't mind and I'm just like, um, why the hell would a tenant pay you for you to use their space as storage? I was feeling really uncomfortable and started moving them back downstairs as they talked. My mom had mentioned when we arrived that her and my dad were going on vacation the next week, but I couldn't go because I had to work. He brought it up again and that I should come by the next week and have dinner with him and the roomies to see if we would all get along. I said sure and we left. As soon as we got in the car, I told my mom I would definitely not be living there. She was dumbfounded. I had to explain to her not only did he lie about the room I would be in, that I was not supposed to be in the basement with him as well as share a bathroom with him, and he didn't even have a damn door. But also did she not notice how no one else even lived there? She still didn't get it and thought I was just being paranoid and thought he was nice and it was a cheap deal. I had to explain it to my stepdad and get him to tell. Her by no means would I be living there. I tried to report the post, but by the time we got home that day he removed it. I think he planned on murdering me at dinner or abducting me and holding me hostage in that basement room that had no way to escape. I hope that guy hits a tree with his car one day. Edit. Some details have been coming back to me since I've been answering all of your questions. This happened in 2011, so it's been quite a while. When he took us upstairs, there was a wide landing that was surrounded by the rooms. As soon as we go up there, he motions towards one of the rooms and started this long, intricate story about the woman who lived in there and talking about her alcoholism and a crazy ex. He was very exaggerated in how he talked with a lot of gestures. My mom stood there listening to him. I don't know if it was sheer distraction or she didn't want to be rude not listening, but either way I don't recall her ever having a good look around those rooms. I went and looked. All doors were open, had neatly made beds with dark wood bed frames, 
bureaus with mirrors and nightstands. There were sliding mirror closets, and they were empty except for one had men's clothes hanging pushed against one corner. Nothing was on the nightstands other than a lamp and nothing on the bureaus. I went into the bathrooms and there was nothing on the vanity in them other than hand soap. I looked in the showers too, but nothing other than bar soap. The bedroom on the left had an empty suitcase laying open on the middle of the bed. This was one of the rooms with the empty closet. After seeing all this, I came back onto the landing and started slowly heading down the stairs. They were still talking and absent-mindedly followed me down to the living room. That's when he mentioned dinner and we left shortly after. I think that's why my mom didn't notice a lot and didn't believe me at first. She didn't take more than a quick glance upstairs and when we were in the basement he was just as as talkative. A common tour on here who works with law enforcement pointed out this was probably a sex trafficking situation. The bedroom in the basement is where a victim is kept, drugged and abused until broken and then trafficked. I honestly think this is more plausible with the situation as well as my city is actually a hot spot for that. I am so grateful we got out of there and I hope my experience could help someone one day notice the details and get out of the situation safely. Stay safe and bless people. Could use a throwaway, but it's also not really a big deal. I thought I was bisexual for the longest time because I always had an interest in guys since high school. Not in any other way than I wanted to try giving head. Well, sure enough, I took to good old Craigslist to find a suitor for my request. Found a guy, texted, and he drove down and I met him in his car. Now it wasn't really anything but a simple transaction, just a blow and go type arrangement. But I realized as soon as I put it in my mouth that I was without a doubt, 100%, undeniably straight. The thing is, he didn't take too kindly to me not finishing him and said that he had put the child locks on the door and I wasn't allowed to leave. Thankfully, either he forgot or was bluffing but I tried the door and booked it into someone's backyard. I wasn't so much frightened as I was trying to get the taste in my mouth. April 2008. At the time, I was an officer with the city of the Moore Police Department. It was around 11, and my partner and I were patrolling near the area around Northwest 19th Street, responding to several calls of screams and an abandoned meat packaging plant. This plant had closed down about 20 years earlier. We never found anything but thought it could have just been teenagers trying to get in trouble. After we investigated all around the plant, not finding anything, we headed back, getting ready to close up the investigation. As we're walking back up, we noticed something large moving behind a chain link fence. Pulling in our flashlights, pointing it toward where we saw movement, that's when we saw it. It jumped off one of the walls on top of the buildings, crouching down, looking at us. It did not look like any animal known here on Earth. It had dark grayish skin with large black eyes, small fangs sticking out of its mouth, and this white hair running down its jawline. With muscular arms almost touching the ground, it looked like a cross between a bat and a human. And it quickly turned, jumping off the building onto another, running across it, and disappearing over a large stack of old wooden planks. My partner looked at me like I was crazy, and I told him what I saw. He said it couldn't be real, and that I was pranking him. But when we got back in our cars ready to leave, we noticed there was also a small hole in the fencing, where something had apparently tried to dig into the ground underneath. As we drove out of there, my partner just seemed to get lost somewhere between his thoughts and fear while looking to me for answers. We searched the perimeter and the surrounding area more but found nothing, ultimately continuing on with our shift. After we were off duty, we went to O'Malley's Bar and Grill, about an hour away near Norman, Oklahoma, and we had a few drinks. Not sure if it was the liquor speaking, but as we talked more after a few beers, he admitted that he had seen the same thing too, just before I called him over to help. He tells me that it reminded him of this vampire entity that would visit him as a child every night and terrify him. He claims it would jump from his closet into his bedroom, growl at him, 
threatened to hurt him and his family. He then describes the same look we saw that night at the plant, the dark gray skin and fangs. But he still denies that this thing was real and that it didn't even exist. When we finished up our beers, we went back to Moore and started our normal routine. This is something that will always stick with me. Okay, for some background story, this takes place at my buddy's house deep in the woods. He has a lot of outside dogs. We live in Southern Maryland, so I've already crossed out the possibility that it was a skinwalker. So it's about 2.30 in the morning and my friend's dogs start going absolutely crazy. So me and my friend peek our heads out his window, and to the right we see this tall moose thing with no flesh on its face. It was just straight skull, there's no moose in Maryland, the moose walks behind a tree and disappeared after we yelled at it. Me and my buddy run outside to where it was, and there wasn't a single track or sign that anything was even there, but we know what we saw. A few years later I was out hunting with a friend when we lost legal light. So we hiked back to the truck and hit the road in his parents' new Ford half-ton, the ones with the sensors all over the vehicle. We had some music playing as we were just heading back towards town again, when the music started acting weird and cutting in and out with static. So me being in the passenger seat, disconnected the Bluetooth and reconnected the phone. Music cleared up and we continued down the road. We got up to the kilometer board on the road that my previous encounter took place and I mentioned, oh hey, that's the whistle block that we logged a couple years back. Half jokingly because I couldn't make heads or tails of it. My friend replied, GRRE at thanks for that. As I had told him the story before, we continued slowly driving down the road because it gets pretty rough in a couple spots and the road has a few sharp turns and an S bend. Well, we go about a kilometer further, and the music starts screeching and doing what we can only describe as alien noises. So I disconnect the Bluetooth again, and my friend says, Oh, mom's got a cord in here. So he stops and gets the cord for me. I plug the phone in and play music again. Another kilometer down the road, and the phone goes ape shit. I mean loud alien squealing and sounds similar to that shitty dial-up internet noise from the 90s. We had started into the S-Bend when this was happening, and we shut the music off completely as we are driving still, making the one half of the S-Turn, and then we both look up from the music deck or screen, and the headlight illuminate a figure standing in the middle of the road. So we swerve and take the ditch a bit, still going probably 30 kilometers an hour, and get the truck back up on the road. We continue coasting down the road as we are both in awe after just seeing a flash of this thing. I finally say after what seemed like five quiet minutes, man, did you just see? My friend cuts me off and says, I have skeleton in the middle of the road. I say, yeah, like a white rib cage and a deer skull for a face. He finishes. I said, turn around. What the F was that? Does someone need our help? Not thinking that we are in the middle of nowhere with no vehicles around or any that we had passed from other hunters it was early season, and no one bow hunts here anyways. My friend said, I'm not turning around, I feel sick, like I'm going to throw up. And he continued driving. We didn't see another vehicle until we hit pavement again. It was taller than the pickup by easily a couple feet. I'm six feet one and my forehead is at the top of the window for reference. It has black surrounding the white of the bones with long arms half stretched to its sides, as if it was saying try and hit me. I watched this thing pass the passenger window and stared up at it as we wailed by it, and it was definitely three-dimensional, tall with long arms and dark. Dead looking. Like light was sucked into it without reflecting anything. Hard to explain. When we hit service again, my friend received a text message from his mother saying, what did you two idiots hit in my brand new truck? I guess the new Ford send near accident reports to the owner when the sensors pick up something. I'm an old school Chevy guy, so I don't know, haha. -ha. The only thing I can find online that resembles what we both saw is a Windigo without the antlers, or the headlights didn't illuminate them anyway.
My fiancé's farm has had a problem with whatever it is for years. However, it really hadn't been an issue as much as a presence. Like having a cougar on your land. You know it's there and could attack at any second. But it just doesn't. Our home is old, by the way very old, and two of the beams in the basement are made up of giant logs that may have come from the woods behind the field. So anyways. The first time its presence was seen, I was on the phone with my guy and he was sitting in his mom's car at night. We were teenagers then. That's when he noticed in this admittedly really odd looking twisted tree that's outside a creature that was large and in his words, looked like a man becoming a beast. He carefully, calmly got out of the car and hurried inside. It didn't seem to notice him. There's still claw marks on the tree, not bear-like or cat-like. I looked up the area and back then Google's so messed up now, I can no longer find it that a Wendigo King has the hunting ground of the entire length of the creek that is down the road. It was this time of year and he said when he saw it, he heard laughter and war drums. Then I moved here years later. One night I saw what I thought was a red reflector by our mailbox. I was confused about who put that there it hadn't been that morning. As I turned my headlights towards the box to better see, the red circle suddenly pulled back into the massive field across the street. As our friend and I got out of the car, he said he saw something that wasn't an animal standing in the field. We hurried inside. This was autumn. The next autumn I was driving home alone and saw that same red reflector bobbing across the street. When I approached it suddenly whipped around like a startled animal and the light zoomed back into the field. I refused to leave the truck without someone coming for me. I should add I've seen that same light pacing the upstairs of the barn through the window. Next time was during the 4th of July and we were having a small party and had the barn door open. When dusk began I saw it. Giant, maybe as big as a horse. It looked like a man with no hair. Grayish purple, I suppose, frostbitten colored skin. Naked. Incredibly skinny as though it has no organs. A big grin on its face which seemed to be either because its lips were forcibly pulled back over its mouth, or perhaps it had no lips or cheeks. Big hands and feet and no antlers. Walking into the barn like a wolf. Reminded me of something out of Bloodborne. Its eyes were black at the moment. I told my guy and he didn't believe me as I was begging him to help me close the barn. There's openings in the back it could leave from, but the door being open didn't feel right after that. Then his great aunt asked, Did anyone see that little girl go into the barn? It's well known by our family that a ghost of a small girl in white roams the farm and is well liked by us. He immediately agreed after that. Then nothing more. Occasionally I feel something reach out for me as I walk around at night, but I've read about W's when I was young, and there's many spiritual things about me that seem to keep me safe. Regardless, I carry a buck knife when I travel at night just in case I have to defend myself. But then his mom left. His mom is very unhealthy and gluttonous in every form. Over two years without her and our farm was peaceful. We had been caring for his grandfather, who always said something dark followed him around. And in the last week of his life, weird things kept happening. Then he died suddenly and nobody knows why. I had stated earlier that month that the more his mom was showing up again and the more we cleaned up and worked on the farm, the angrier something seemed to get. In fact, a few weeks before something grabbed onto my guy's father in the barn and make horrible screeches when he put up the mower after dark. There was also one night the barn got left open by him, and as we were headed inside, we heard the neighbors screaming. But my guy assured me that he hears them do that every few months. However, while the men sound like they're getting murdered, the woman always sounds fake. But I always hated their house because turkey vultures obsessively circle their plot. Like a lot, sometimes 20. So then two nights ago, my guy had to help his mom, who's now situated herself into his grandma's home like the parasite she is for almost two weeks. Things had been feeling peaceful and earlier that day I had been hoping that grandpa captured the creature inside his body and it was going to be killed when he got cremated. Well, then they heard the lady neighbor screaming. Repeatedly. Inhumanly. 
from our pond. Before that they thought they heard a sound like a cat growl as well. Well now his dumb mother is going around personifying it as she and saying she's a witch, but that she's nice and spoke to her and she don't mean no harm. I've been a practicing white witch my whole life. That is an evil spirit. She's a fool. Furthermore, as she was blabbing that to my boyfriend's sister who was driving home at night, a deer suddenly exploded out of nowhere and destroyed her car. This sister was wanting to inherit the land around the pond. Mid-May we had also had a deer jump in front of us so fast it seemed impossible. Biggest deer I had ever seen and impossibly beautiful looking. Thankfully many people stayed with us while the cops got there. But ever since she had been visiting the last month worse and worse things have been happening. Which brings me to today. To me myself. My guy was gone early today to help his uncle out. I was sleeping alone for the first time in months. I had a nightmare. It was that you sent me home from the food pantry because you had more stuff to do, but it was night. So I parked near next door because the food was for them and got out, and suddenly your mom came out from behind the house and was talking to me and I was just trying to get done quickly. But then I realized the whole time she was over I couldn't quite make out her face. So I started turning my flashlight onto her and your mom was like, Oh honey, now you don't want to do that. And when I did it was like seeing a refracted shadow. Like behind this vague silhouette was the appearance of your mom's hair and hands and feet. But the shadow was in front with this incomplete appearance of her in the back. And when I realized what it was my heart stopped and I started slowly backing up to their porch as this terrifyingly powerful man's voice said, you don't want to do that. Before my head erupted with terrifying music and that voice laughing maniacally enough to drive someone insane. But I kept continually calmly going to the porch as I began to forcibly pray and say in the name of God and Jesus leave me alone and Christ compels you and all that stuff. This is what I had texted him. It was horrifying and I could sense it didn't want to devour me. It wanted to keep me. I said I was a practicing witch but I also have been confirmed as a Catholic, and I have a belief that's parts of every old religion and some of my own beliefs that I've formed from things I've been witness to. I awoke feeling like something was at my back, but my oldest cats were laying on me, defensively. They're all still laying in bed with me and hadn't really in a long time. As I tried to get back to sleep, I prayed for my home and family to be kept safe, for positive energy to cover the land, and for evil spirits to be cast off of our land. Over and over and over until I finally fell back to sleep and had no more dreams. I have the most knowledge of mythical beings. I sing many songs while I work outside, including Cherokee songs. I work the land the old-fashioned way. I respect the land. Animals love me. And I've always felt that my soul is very, very old. Like it's been recycled for many lives. People always have called me a godsend as well, because I'm at the right place at the right time to help. I don't quite know what it wanted of me, but it didn't work because I'd previously been visited in my dreams many times by a demon who insisted my soul belonged to him, only for me to deny him each time. This being when I was only a teenager. What I need is help to keep it off our land. At this rate, my guy's mom is going to be killed by it or bring it closer to us all with her horrific miasma of an aura. I was already planning on planting sage and smudging the house as well. I've previously done so before, but if there's anything else we can do, I'd appreciate it. Any help at all. And I also know its hunting ground is indeed as vast as the creek is because a co-worker who lives at the other end, we're near one ending point, caught it on video when he was walking at night and showed me. Its eyes looked like the red reflector I kept seeing. It seems to like to rest in our barn. But it's always been that we leave it be, and it leaves us be. Please help. I downloaded the app so I can easily check back. Only serious answers, please. I know there are skeptics to many things. I respect everyone's opinions and personal beliefs. But this is very serious. Also, I should add that as far as I know, there are no reservations around here at all but that his great-grandfather was part Native American. Don't know what tribe. 
Thank you for any assistance. This has been over the course of roughly 10 years, by the way. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.